21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. You what? Smell gas? Where is this? East 70 what? What for? You haven't found where it's coming from? That's right. Get the people out. See if you can locate where it's coming from. No, no. No, that's all right. We'll take care of it. You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. You'll have assistance right away. Yes, sir, right away. No, no, just stay where you are. The officers will be there right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. It was Tuesday morning. I'd been on the job since 8 when I turned out the platoon for the day tour. After I read and signed reports, I went on patrol of the precinct with Patrolman Farrell as my operator. As we turned off Park Avenue into 72nd Street, a signal 32 came over the air. 618 East 75th Street. Ambulance and emergency squad responding. Sounded like a gas case. I told Farrell to make the run. When we turned into the block, I could see that sector car number one was on the job. So was the sergeant's car. There was no sign of either the ambulance or the ESG car. 618 was a five-story tenement building. A few passers-by and neighbors were beginning to gather on the sidewalk. There's the spot, Farrell. Pull in. Yes, sir. All right, let's go. Right with you, Captain. That's either the ESC or the ambulance coming now. Yeah. Keep the sidewalk clear, Farrell. Keep off the stoop. That's all right, folks. Will you let it, let it through, yeah? You, will you please get off the stoop? Big here, Farrell. Yes, sir. Boy, oh, I can smell that gas out here. It's sick. Farrell. Yes, sir. Keep people away from those doorbells. Yes, sir. Now, look, I told you to get off the stoop. Sergeant Collins. Captain Kennelly. Second floor, Captain. All right. Kennelly! <coughs> what do you find out there? I don't think it's like this. I'm just taking the people down. I want the building clear. I'm sending them, Sergeant. Sergeant? Get back, Captain. All right. Anybody home in there? Open up, open up. It's the police. Where is it, Sergeant? Beats me, Captain. We haven't been able to locate it. No, we better locate it fast. Open We're up in there. And the building up. Open up in there. There's nobody's home, Captain. We've been hitting every door. I sent a man up to third and another to fifth. We're clearing everybody out. It's not on this floor. Coley! Yes, Sergeant. Did you locate it? No, He's on the fourth floor, Captain. Whole hall smells the gas. No telling where it's coming from. Well, who put in the call? Super. He's up with Coley. Tenant smell gas in the hall. Well, how about the main feed line? I send glass into the basement with the super glass to turn off the valve. Good. Now, uh, come on, folks. Don't stand there and talk about it. Out on the street, please. Get in the sidewalk. Did you open your windows, folks? And have your doors open? Out of the building. All right, come on. Yes, sir. Anybody cover the third floor yet? Just quickly and away up, Captain. I told those people to clear out. Not them. Let's try that one here. Smells pretty strong here. Police officers, open up in there. Police officers, open up. This could be it, Captain. Open up. Curly. Yes, Come on down here. Bring the super with you. Okay. Well, this is it, I'm sure. What do you want to do, Captain? Push the door in? Yeah. All right, let's go. Together. Again. Now. Is that it, Sergeant? You think so, yeah. Let me see if I can kick it. Go ahead. Try it again. Yep, this is it, all right? Keep low. Coley, hit that window. I'll get this one. Here's the... Sergeant, get the stove. I've got 
Captain. How's the other window, Coley? Sure, Captain. <laughs> yeah, looks like the culprit, Captain. Yeah. Coffee boiled over. Put out the flame. Sure ruined a good coffee pot. Well, that looks like about it. Coley. Yes, sir. Take a look in that room. See if anybody's in there. Yes. Let's try this one, Sergeant. Only one burner was on, Captain. Looks like an accident. Nobody in here. Coley, anybody in that room? No, sir, nobody. Well, the ambulance and the EFD just got here. You can head them off, Sergeant. We don't need them. Yes, sir, right away. Say, Coley, where's the super? I left him out in the hall, Captain. Well, I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Let's give this room a chance to air him <clears throat> out. Who is it down there, Phil? Yes, Sergeant. Mr. Campisi. Tell the EFD and the ambulance we won't need them. Coffee boiled over. Nobody hurt. You want to see me? Yeah, this is Captain Kennelly, Mr. Philip Champisi, Superintendent. Glad to know you. How are you? Real mess this turned out to be. Real mess. Well, it could have been worse. I headed off the ambulance in the SG, Captain. Good. Hey, listen, was it necessary to kick the door in? Look at that. The panel is split. The lock is busted. Ain't worth much of anything now. What would you expect us to do, Mr. Champisi? There might have been somebody overcoming here, or a spark could have blown up the building. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm the one that's got to explain to the landlord. I'm the one that's got to ask him for a new door, new hardware. This could never be fixed, never. Even the frame is shot. Look, what's the name of the tenant here? The tenant? Yeah. Well, the tenant is a fellow named Harrods, Alfred Harrods. Listen, is any damage inside? Just to the coffee pot. Oh, well, that ain't the landlord. That's his, Harrods. None of these flats furnished. The tenants got to furnish their own furniture and furnishings. Where is he? What do you mean, where is he? Where'd he go? Well, listen, as long as he pays his rent, he can come and go as he pleases. I don't keep track of him. Can we, uh, we take a look inside? I, I just want to check for sure there's no damage. I, I got to call the landlord, give him the whole story. You got this pretty well cleared out by now, huh, Captain? Yeah, I'd imagine. The uh, landlord's going to hit the ceiling about this door. Still smells pretty bad of gas in here. Oh, it's all right. You, uh, you don't have any idea where this tenant could be. Well, I told you. Did you call the police? Yeah, that was me. Mrs. Truro on the fourth floor come down and knocked on my door. She said she smelled gas in the hall, you know. Well, I came upstairs and I checked. Checked immediately. Sure enough. Well, I couldn't tell where it was coming from, though. I had the same trouble as you, so I called. Mm -hmm. well, who knows what could happen in a situation like that? You, you got to call. Uh, don't look like there's any damage to stove, huh? Listen, Mr. Champisi, this whole thing was very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. New door. Oh, the place could have been blown sky high. I want you to call the station house when this tenant gets home. I want to send an officer over here to talk to him about going out and leaving a pot of coffee on the fire. Talk to him myself. Well, you call the station house. Yeah, okay, I'll call. He's calling. Yes, sir. Go downstairs and tell Farrell he can let the tenants up now. It's all over. Yes, sir. He should be given a piece of somebody's mind. Where does he work? Well, I don't know. He's um, a salesman, I think. He sells things. Yeah? What? Well, I don't know. I never asked him. He paid up two months' rent in advance when he moved in, so I wasn't too curious. Well, how long has he lived here? Oh, three, four weeks. You know, he had a phone put in. It's the only phone in the building. Besides mine, which the landlord stands good for. If a guy can afford a phone, I don't worry too much. Did you see him this morning? No. No, I don't budge out of my place. Not unless I have to. I still smell a little gas in here, Captain. Well, check that burner again. Yes, sir. Looks off to me. It is. Well, open up the oven. Yes, sir. Well, what do you know? Hey, that's a fine thing to keep in the oven. Paper. What is it, Sergeant? Policy slip. Let's see that. No wonder the guy looks like a millionaire. Just in cash, Captain. Hey, is all that good? It's good. I never saw so much money in a lump. Looks like we've got a policy drop, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, listen, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the guy did. Don't hold it against me that he lived here. Tenant is a tenant and, until he proves himself otherwise. Coley. Yes, sir? Let's see what else we can find around here, Sergeant. Yes, sir, Captain. Uh, give uh, Sergeant Collins a hand. Yes, sir. Let's start over here. You never know about some people. Numbers game in my building. You just never know. On discovery that the flat in which there had been a gas leak was occupied by a person in apparent violation of the gambling laws, I instructed Sergeant Collins to notify the desk officer at the 21st, who in turn would notify the office of the division commander so that plain men responsible for the enforcement of gambling laws would be sent to the scene to investigate. 
As this notification was being made, a more thorough search of the premises was conducted by patrolmen Coley and Farrell under my supervision and in the presence of the civilian witness, Philip Champisi, the superintendent of the building. In a closet were found two electric calculating machines and tally sheets in addition to the policy slips and the cash. 80, 800, 20, 35, 45, 6, 7, 8, 9, 50. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Like a gold mine. $2,857, Captain. All right, Coley. Enter the amount in your memorandum book. Yes, sir. Hey, now, here's an opportunity. Let's all go to Belmont. We could, we could still make the daily double. You want to sign my book, Captain? Yeah. Yeah, hey, what's all the production? Are you afraid this Harrods guy might say you shortchanged him? Well, we just don't want to give him anything to say. Farrell. Yes, sir. You got all that stuff together? Yes, sir. We'll need a bushel basket for all these policy slips, Captain. Boy, this guy was running some bank. Uh, Mr. Champese. Yeah. What, uh, what happens to all the money? Oh, it gets turned over to the property clerk until the court determines who's the rightful owner. Well, listen, uh, could you give me some consideration? You know, if I didn't put in the call, you never would have found it. When did you say this Mr. Harrods moved in here? Oh, I don't know, uh, three, four weeks ago. And he told you he was a salesman? Yeah, that's sir. He didn't tell you anything else. What do you mean? He didn't tell you what he sold? Well, listen, I, I didn't know anything about him. What can I do? Now, listen, Captain. Are the plane clothesmen on the way, Sergeant? Yes, sir. But one of the tenants told me he saw the girlfriend of the fellow who has this flat standing outside in the crowd. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I forgot to tell you about his girlfriend. Is she still there? She was when I came up. I told Farrell to keep an eye on her. Take charge here, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Champ, is he? Yeah. Man, what a day. You look to be 100 and never see so much excitement, huh? Uh, how about, how about smoke, Captain? Give me that. Oh, oh, oh. oh I'm sorry, the gas. Yeah, excuse me, I, I forgot, Captain. Well, you better remember, or you'll never get anywhere near a hundred. Come on, let's get downstairs. Although the flat in which the gas leak had occurred was obviously a policy drop, there was no conclusive evidence that would lead to a conviction of either Harrods or any of his associates, despite the large amount of cash discovered, the calculating machines, the policy slips, and the tally sheets. Both the policy slips and the tally sheets were from previous day's play and it's a good idea to have evidence showing the play was made on the day of the arrest. It was my thought to keep the girlfriend of Harrods under surveillance until the plainclothesman arrived. Then, as they thought best, they could question her, take her to the station house, or attempt to follow her in order to connect him directly with the evidence. On the way downstairs, I told the super of the building that I wanted to stand outside on the stoop and talk to him, apparently in connection with the accident. I warned him not to look in the direction of the girl, nor point to her. All right, I'll, I'll do just like you say. Count on it, Captain. I hope I can. Farrell. Yes, sir. Uh, don't look in her direction, but uh, which girl is it? See the gray Plymouth coupe parked at the curb there? Yeah. She's standing right next to it, Captain. The blonde, about 25 years old, 5'4", has on a beige coat. Yeah. That's her, all right. I've seen her go up to visit him time and time again. I asked her not to look over there. I didn't look. I just glimpsed. Just talk to me. What do you want me to talk about? Uh, weather? That'll do. Well, uh, <clears throat> looks like it's going to turn into a nice day after all, huh? You know, when I woke up today, looked out the window, I had my doubts. Uh, listen, Captain, what happens to the $2,850? Does he get that back? I told you he does if he can prove it's lawfully his. Oh, well, who is it you're waiting for? Detectives? Plain clothesmen. Well, what's the difference? Plain clothesmen? Detectives? I always thought they were the same. No. Plain clothesmen are assigned to enforce gambling and vice laws. Oh. Detectives investigate all other serious crimes. You know, I never knew that. No, I suppose a lot of people don't. Oh, you'd be surprised. You'd be very surprised. Have you seen her here very often, Mr. Champisi? On occasion. On several occasions. When? Daytime or at night? Both. But my wife, she knows everything goes on around here. My wife says she's here all the time. Day, night, afternoon. She's turning to go, Captain. Yeah, I see her. Any sign of the plane clothesman? No, sir. What are you going to do? This, this is getting to be a situation. Stay here, pal. Yes, sir. You too. Excuse me, please. Yes, sir. Pardon me. Miss. Miss, wait a minute. Me? Yeah. What's your name, miss? Who are you? I'm a police officer. What do you want to know my name for? I want to know. 
Gloria. Gloria Nathan. Who's your friend in that building? What building? 618 East 75th. I don't think I have to tell you that. It's Al Harrods, isn't it? No, it isn't. Well, who is it then? Nobody. Well, why were you standing outside there? Well, I was just curious. I'm entitled to be curious when there's excitement going on. It's Al Harrods, isn't it? He's your friend. No. You came by to see him this morning. When you were walking down the street toward the place, you saw the police there. You were worried. You found out the gas leak was in his place. Listen, I don't know any Al Harris. I told you that. I was just standing there because I was curious, that's all. Look, Gloria, you don't want to get into trouble, do you? I won't get in trouble. You will if you keep telling me one lie after another. What can you do to me? You can't do anything to me. Would you mind walking back to the building with me? Of course I'd mind. Well, let's walk back anyway. I haven't done anything. I don't see why you're picking on me just because I was curious. Well, there's a few things we want to get straightened out. If you want to get something straightened out, that's no business of mine. What's it got to do with me? Uh, Mr. Champesi. The person is entitled to be curious. You call me, Jeff? Yes. Is uh, this young woman a friend of Al Harris? Yeah. He's a friend of his. I've seen her go up there. That's a lie. Plenty of time. I never even heard of any Al Harris. The plain clothes, Miss Captain. This is getting to be ridiculous. You're telling him. Hello, Captain. Thomas, how have you been? Fine. I understand you struck gold. That's right. Look, all this is well and good, but what do you want with me? I've got a right to know. Sure, you've got a right to know. We're going to take you to the station house. One of the plain clothes men went upstairs to take charge of the premises, while the other accompanied the young woman, Gloria Navin, and I to the station house. A policewoman was sent for to make a search of the suspect. In the meantime, Patrolman Coley and Sergeant Burns returned to the station house with the money found in the flat. This was turned over to the desk officer and entered in the blotter. In about a half hour, the policewoman arrived and made a search of the clothing and purse of the suspect. Nearly 1,000 policy slips and about $400 in cash was found on her person. While the policewoman sat nearby, Gloria was questioned in my office. Well, now, look, you know what's going to happen to you, don't you? No, I don't know. What? As soon as we get through talking to you, I'm going to take you out there to the desk and book you in. Then you're going to ride down to court and talk to the judge. They won't keep me. I've got the number of a bondsman. All I have to do is call him. That only lets you out until the trial. What good the bondsman going to do you after he's sentenced? You're headed straight for the house of detention. You ever been in there? No. No, I haven't. No, I didn't know. That's why I asked you. You know you can get a year out of this, Gloria? No, he wouldn't be that tough. I'm never that tough in these kind of cases. That's the captain. It'd be a suspended sentence or a fine, maybe. You know that. Well, I don't know. The judge is going to say to me, he's going to say that you cooperate, officer. And what can I say? All I can do is tell him the truth. All I can say is, judge, she wasn't a bit of help. Her boyfriend had this policy drop, but there wasn't a bit of conclusive evidence up there. She had all the incriminating evidence in her possession. She wouldn't help us at all. I've seen people stand up there. They think, who you hurt in making a little book or writing a few numbers tickets? I think the most I'll get out of it is a slap on the wrist, and wham, they get it right between the eyes. And it doesn't make any difference what you think or what I think about it. Gambling is a violation of the law. The way things are, pressure's on the judges, too. They let somebody off easy in a gambling case, they get criticized. They've been handing out some jolts down there, isn't that right, Captain? Oh, so I hear. He wouldn't give me a year. You want to take the chance, it's up to you. All I can tell him is that you want a bit of help. Supposing I want some help. I wouldn't want to do a year. It's not worth it. Well, like I said, all I can do is tell him the truth. But it stands to reason he'd get a lot more consideration if I could tell him, for instance, that you helped us knock over a big policy bank. He'd kill me. He'd just kill me. Who? Ah, he beats me up for no reason at all. What would he do to me if I gave him a reason? Well, it wasn't your fault that he was stupid enough to go away and leave the fire burning under the coffee, was No, it? but he's not going to look at it that way. You don't know how. I'd like to help you, but you know how it is. Well, that's too bad. I'd like to help you, too. Shame we can't do anything for each other. Let's book her in, Captain. No sense wasting any more time. Come on, Gloria. This way. You wouldn't be that tough on me, the judge. I can't tell you what's on the judge's mind. This way. No sense making any predictions. It all depends. There's nothing to do but take my chances. Stand right up to the desk, then. Eh? I want to book her in, Sergeant. What's the name? M-A-V-A-N. Gloria. How old are you, Gloria? 24. Address? 321 Lewiston Avenue. In Manhattan? In Manhattan, yeah. Listen, the only thing I'm worried about is what he'd do to me. 
Alan. He couldn't do anything to you if you never saw him again. But if you're that crazy about him, what's the use of talking? Who said I'm crazy about him? Where were you born? In the Bronx. Listen, I'm not going to do a year for him. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? That's what I've been trying to impress on you. Who's going to look out for you if you don't look out for yourself? Any prior arrests and convictions? One arrest. No conviction. All right. What do you want to know? Am I a friend of Al Harris? Yes. Do I work for him, too? Yes. What else? Is there any way he could have known about what happened at his place today? Only if I called him and told him, that was the only way. Where was he? You know, around. Making his collections and meeting his runners. He couldn't have known. There's no way. Where is he now? I don't know where he is now, but I know where he'll be at 2 o'clock. Where? He'll be at a bar and grill in Yorkville, 736 East 85th. He meets a couple of his collectors there every day. They turn over their play and the collections to him. In the bar? No. He parks his car... They all got keys to the trunk. He just sits in there while they drop the play and money in the trunk of his car. When he comes out, it's all ready to drive away. He just sits in there and drinks beer. Is that what you wanted to know? I told you. You're going to save me that year? Like I said, I'll tell him the truth. Okay. Oh, he'll get out of bond and he'll beat me up. He'll just beat the living daylights out of me. All right, if you're worried about that, we'll see that you get protection. He won't lay a hand on you. Listen, please worry about your own job. If Al wants to beat me up, that's between me and him. We took Lawyer back into my office, and she supplied us with all the information she was able to furnish. It was decided that Thomas's partner remain at the flat in the event Al Harris returned there unexpectedly. At 2.45, I accompanied Thomas to the vicinity of the bar and grill on East 85th Street. Gloria could give us only a hazy description of his car, and we were unable to spot it parked on the street. A little after 3 o'clock, we walked into the bar and grill. Gloria had described Al Harrods as a short and rather heavy set man. She said he would probably be wearing a plaid sports shirt, a type for which he had a passion. There's a fellow in a plaid shirt back there in the booth. Al Harrods, did she say? That's the name he used. Al Board, Captain. I've been wondering where he was the last couple of months. You, uh, you know him, huh? Real well. Oh, hello, Al. Oh, hi. Stand up, Al. Hey, listen, I'm clean. Come on, stand up. All right. That's the way. Ah, I guess you are clean. You could have taken my word for it. You know, I was just thinking about you the other day, Al. Oh, were you? I sure was. Uh, this is Captain Kennelly. Hello. How are you? You don't mind if we uh, sit down, do you, Al? No, no, no. Help yourself. Thanks. Plenty of room. Captain, did he say uh, you're a cop, too? That's right. What have you been doing with yourself lately, Al? I haven't seen you around. Well, you know, that last 90 days in Rikers Island cured me. And I said to myself... Al, it don't pay. Hang up. That's no hotel in the mountains over there on Rikers Island, you know. Dump the racket. How are you getting along? Fine. Just fine. Live around here? No, I'm, uh, I'm over Jersey now. Oh, what are you doing here? You still working out of this division? That's right. You too, Captain? He's commander of the 21st Precinct. No kidding. Captain... This Al is an example of how a good boy can turn out to be an honest citizen. You stick him a couple of times, and he learns the racket doesn't pay. You living in Jersey, hmm? Yeah, that's right. You working? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm breaking my back every day. Working for my wife's brother over there. He's got a poultry business. You don't say. Yeah, up the crack of dawn every day. Well, what are you doing in the big city? Oh, I just came over to see a fellow, a friend of mine. You want something, Captain? I'll get the girl over. No, no thanks. So I cured you, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm walking that tightrope now. I'm on a square and I love it. Well, didn't I tell you? You wouldn't believe me. Well, I believe you now, Mr. Thomas. I'll never forget you. Won't you, Al? No, sir. You know, I've been a long time in this job, Al. It's not many guys you run into who can make you feel that you accomplished something. You make me feel that way, Al, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it, too, Mr. Thomas. Captain, this guy's made my day. You wouldn't kid me, Al. Well, would I lie to you, Mr. Thomas? No, Al, I don't believe you would. Nah, not me, brother. I learned. That's for the birds. Well, 
I gotta go. It's nice to see you, Al. Yeah. Uh, just a second, Al. We're going to. Oh. Captain, if I know this guy, I'll bet you he's hustling policy slips across the river in Jersey. I'm telling you, I'm out of it. Since I finished that bit on Rikers Island, I'm out of it. After you, Captain. Thanks. I mean, uh, maybe uh, I play the numbers once in a while. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not so bad. But book them? Not me, brother. I had my stomach full of that. That's for the birds. Well, here's my car. Yeah, it sure is for the birds, Al. And you're a folk, too, with a 20-foot wing spread. Yeah. All right. Open up the trunk of your car. I know. What's going on? Go on. Open it up. Al, we hit your place on 75th Street. We got you $2,800 in cash and a go-kart full of policy slips. Put the key in. Well, what are you stringing me along for, a 20-foot wing spread? You were stringing yourself along, Al. Well, you could be frank. Well, look. Another gold mine, Captain. It's metal cruel. He let me think I conned you out of it. All right. Close it up. Be careful, Thomas. Watch that he doesn't fly away. He's a bird. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Collins. What is this? Thirty three sixty one. How was he shot? How many hold up, man? Just one. Which way and so it goes around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Featured in tonight's cast were Mandel Kramer, Bill Quinn, Bill Lipton, Joan Loring, Bill Zuckert, John Sylvester, and Jack Orison. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. <laughs>